I am so pleased to be here among many of my heroes, um, people who have been through really traumatic experiences, but have taken those experiences and have advocated in ways that most of us really can't, can't certainly we can't copy, but it's even hard to understand. Um, there, are, there are people in here that have been to governors, have been to district attorneys, have been to the halls of power, and have spoken truth to power. Andre Smith, I mean, a lot of you, a lot of you have done that. And it's just incredibly inspiring. It's, it's not just um, important work, it's courageous work. So thank you very much. Um, so I tried to figure out how to tell a story and have for a long, long time about one of my clients, Tillman Goffin. Uh, I've represented innocent people, um, Henry McCollum, and, um, and, and I understand how to tell that story. I understand, and public understands, right? We, all, we understand innocent people that have been incarcerated for 30 years. And, you never, never had an opportunity, never did anything wrong. We can understand those stories. Levon Jones is another person I represented who was also innocent, was exonerated, but had, did not get a pardon of innocence, and you probably haven't heard of him. But how do you tell the story of a person who actually committed the crime? And how do you tell it in a way that, that people can hear and not just think about the crime itself. And, and how do you do that, particularly when it's been the, the person who's, the people who are the victims are law enforcement officers. And so that is Tillman Goffin's story. And I, you know, I didn't know this before I came today, but Thomas C. McDonald is here. And he told a piece of this story in The Independent in 1998 in a way that no one else had, had captured before or since. Because he understood when he watched that trial in Fayetteville that this wasn't just an individual 19-year-old kid who was a terrible person and caught up and, and who deliberately killed someone. This is a much bigger story. This is a story about a brother who is trying to defend his 17-year-old brother, when he was stopped by police officers for not wearing a seatbelt on I-95. And this is a story about race relations in the 19, late 1990s. This is a story about a person who's charged in Fayetteville in Cumberland County, but they moved the trial. And where would they move the trial if it's an African-American defendant? accused of killing two white police officers. Where would you think they would move the trial? Well, of course, they would move it to Johnson County, <laughs> which at the time, I believe, still had the sign, welcome to the home of the Klan. That's what they did. And when do you think they would try the case? Um, do you think they'd give the defense attorneys a lot of time to prepare in such a sensational case? Do you think they would? give them all the resources they needed. Well, Tillman Goffin and his brother Kevin were tried five months after the crime itself. They were, the jury was selected five months after the crime. And that, in the modern era, is the quickest trial in the state of North Carolina. Wow. The quickest trial. And would you think they would be very careful about their jury selection? And they would make sure there's a diverse jury to make sure that things look fair. Well, no. So Tillman Goffin was tried with 11 white jurors and one African-American juror with a jury selected from Johnson County. And what would happen if you had a war veteran who was African-American, who was in favor of the death penalty, who sought to serve on the jury, how would the prosecutors treat that person? Well, it happens that that war veteran overheard two people behind him say, 
they should have taken him out and, and killed him in the woods where they captured him. Mm. Now, did those jurors get, get excused? No. But did Mr. Murray, who was the war veteran, get excused? He did. Wow. He was struck by the prosecution. And he was struck by the prosecution in part because he came forward to the judge and said, you know, there were two white jurors behind me who said they should have taken him out and hung him. And that was one of the reasons given by the prosecution to strike Mr. Murray. So I am really honored today. Cameron Bynum has taken that story because I have such a tough time trying to tell it in a way that people can hear it. Cameron's taken it and put it into a very powerful form. Um, I just want to start by saying I really appreciate the opportunity of standing here today, the opportunity to speak to so many people just as involved and not so many people who care about this work, who understand its importance, people like Ken who has worked tirelessly throughout his life in order to support people like Tillman and others here who, for whom often they can feel that there are no other avenues, there are no way, other ways for justice to be made. And these are the kind of people who come and make that a possibility. I also want to present a little bit before I started, saying a little over a month ago, Ken presented me with this story, the story of Tillman Goffin, who at the age of 19 was sentenced to death after killing two police officers in defense of his brother, mainly because the prosecutor called the, his Rastafarian religion the start of a race war in America. Um, as regrettable as the officer's defense, the officer's death ha may have been, we must realize here in today's age of police violence, that where cops are routinely acquitted for the murder of black teens, that we have always been an age of state-sponsored state violence, that we have always transitioned smoothly from slavery to lynchings to death penalty. As more and more black culture is incorporated into uh, pop culture being whitewashed, it is imperative for us to know about the criminalization of our liberation, about the ways in which policing the black body is and as always has been a driving force towards white supremacy and plundering black people in general and people like Tillman in particular. Um, I also want to say there are things that I won't be able to cover in this poem, such as the fact that the Racial Justice Act was repealed by Republicans, and that stands as one of the major reasons that Tillman is still on death row today, because that Racial Justice Act prohibited the death penalty being used in cases for the justification of race. With all that said, um, I'm, excited to talk to, I'm excited to give my poem. There's some humor in here because sometimes I feel like that is the only way to address the absurdities of injustice in America, and I thank you. I hate all frat boys, but in particular, I hate reggae frat boys. Grown white children that think weed works as soap, deodorant, and toothpaste. Oily, dread-headed colonizers who will put hot topic whaler posters up next to a Confederate flag and can't tell the difference between oxtails and cowtails. <laughs> These Buffalo killing soldiers will make you think that one love is an all lives matter anthem and not a song about fighting that hopeless center who will kill mankind to protect his power. How quickly they gentrify liberation. Martin Luther King, a half remembered dream about white kids sitting at the black lunch table and getting off in January. Um, Mandela and Morgan Freeman have merged bodies and Marley's just a metaphor for 420. I hate superheroes with black in the name, but maybe that's going to save us a few years before I see to Chad holding up a tiki torch calling for his own white conda on Reddit. There's a post asking for white nationalist reggae that doesn't, quote, promote a degenerate lifestyle. <laughs> and I'm on phase because this is not the first time I've seen Patois twisted into a lynching. Two brothers, Tillman and Kevin Goffin, are sentenced to their death in their teens after a prosecutor called their Rastafarianism a race war. 
Both are caught fleeing a household with more whelps and whiskey than water in the home, pulled over in Clan County, North Carolina, pulled out of their car. Kevin is maced on the side of the highway, and Tillman takes the cop's rifle because, quote, I don't want them to make me into another Rodney King and fires. It may not have been right, but when later a juryman said those boys shouldn't have made it out of the woods that day, you realize he saved his brother, just a year too young for his own state-sponsored murder, but condemned himself. Tillman's own words, own letters read aloud in court, death to Babylon, kill the whitey. One look at this angry black teen with all it took with for his, with his head full of dreads and tongue foreign was all it took for this jury to see a killer in this kid. Scared for his brother, scared for his life. In the closing remarks, the prosecutor held up a Bible and said, Whoso sheddeth blood, man's blood shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. I wonder what image this man has of God. This man who struck every black name off that jury. This man who two years prior let a pair of Nazis escape who had killed as many as Tillman. This is a system working. Black men are killed for their religion while white men scalp their dreads and steal their tongues to sing an off-key version of redemption songs. You can almost hear them. These these children of the same jurors who sent countless black boys to the death singing so loud, don't worry about a thing, because every little thing is going to be all right, as if for them it has ever been anything but they are singing our songs of freedom when there are those like Tillman for whom the only freedom he asks for is life. <laughs>